I have considered, seriously considered, plastic surgery two or three times in my life. And I want to qualify today's topic on this might get uncomfortable uh, by describing my thought process and, uh, I suppose, emotional compass toward the consideration of plastic surgery throughout my life, which hasn't been a thought in in quite some time. When I was younger, I was pretty relentlessly teased about my nose. Um, I feel like my whole life I've had a pretty unusual looking nose. Um, my nostrils are pretty big, all things considered. Um, I've had my nose broken badly one time. That was another time that I thought about getting plastic surgery. I, in addition to being relentlessly teased about my nose, um, to the point where, where, uh, one ex-girlfriend I had in high school, uh, had an ongoing joke referring to me as Pumbaa, the warthog from the Lion King, which was cute at first until she like wouldn't let it go. And then it started to get really annoying. And it was also like one of those things where my entire childhood, Whitney, I mean, I, I think between probably the ages of God, if I had to think, you know, probably between seven and 17, that 10 year period, it was just, it was, kids are many kids. I don't want to make a sweeping job. Many kids are cruel really fucking cruel. Um, and so I was just kind of relentlessly teased over having a, I don't even know, I say unusual, but they, they, they certainly had much, uh, much less kind things to say. When I was playing basketball in high school, uh, I broke it pretty badly and uh, still have a bump on the bridge from that breakage. And that was another time I was like, well, I've been teased for years and now my nose is really badly broken. This might be the time to finally get a nose job, AKA rhinoplasty. Well, long story short, I've never had plastic surgery or reconstructive surgery in my life, even though I strongly considered it as a child and a teenager. And this leads me to a interesting article that Whitney and I have been perusing about, uh, apparently it's called a zoom boom. This is a thing I'd never heard about. After 15 months at the time of this recording of a global pandemic, apparently uh, people looking at their faces on Zoom calls and Skype calls and I suppose looking at their perceived imperfections for a longer period of time than they ever have has led to a pretty startling spike in cosmetic surgery procedures. Um, there's an interesting article on Refinery29 that we'll link to in the show notes at wellevator.com. Uh, anything that we talk about, any books, any articles, you, any, did I say dot com? Just, yeah, you oh, did. I, I sounded kind of South African, didn't I? Dot cam. Uh, that was a horrible South African impression, but I, I noticed it. I didn't know if you would say anything. Anyway, <laughs> you did notice. <laughs> well, I just wanted to make sure people didn't get confused. Yeah. They're like, Dot came. Yeah. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> go to Wellavada. Go, go to Wellavada dot came. Yeah. <laughs> the website is spelled W E L L E V A T R dot C O M. That is where you will find all the links and the transcript for the show notes. So in this article on refinery 29, um, Whitney, uh, it talks a lot about how people have become, I don't know if they've become more self-conscious or it has made their self-consciousness more acute as a result of staring at their face. You know, but but th- this brings up before we get into the nitty-gritty of this article and 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 talking about it, I want to just share a little bit about again my experience and why I didn't choose to have plastic surgery. The reason that I didn't choose to ultimately get a nose job is well A, I mean I, Social media comments aside, I found that as I grew up, people were less cruel and less pointing out my nose and its purported unusualness. Like pretty much after college, you know, no one seemed to comment or give a shit or at least not say anything verbally. That was one part of it. The other part of it was like, you know what? I was born with this. My nose is kind of unusual in terms of length and proportion and whatever, but but it makes me unique. It makes me part of who I am. Why do I want to change it? And look like everyone else with like a cute button nose. Like we, we get into beauty standards, which we've talked about many times in many previous episodes. We'll link to those in the show notes. We've talked about the the 
cruel and oppressive beauty standards in Western culture that start to make everyone want to look the same. And I thought, okay, if I go in for a nose job, and I even remember kind of like uh, doing pictures, like where I would manipulate my nose to how I wanted it to look and like, oh, maybe I can show this to the surgeon. And But I realized, Whitney, that if I if I went through with it, it would take away one of my, my, I believe, one of my more distinct and unique features of my body. And in doing so, what is the point? Do I want to fit in? Do I want to look like everyone else? Is this a trauma response to the, the, the cruelty I experienced as a child? Like, what is the reason I'm going to go and pay for this surgery? And for me, I realized it was a combination of like, well, if I start to look like everyone else, then no one's ever going to tease me ever again. It's almost like a protective mechanism against receiving the cruelty from people and their comments. The second thing was, well... Maybe I'm not lovable with this nose. Maybe this nose makes me ugly. Maybe if I'm ugly, no one's going to love me and want to be with me. And I think I think it took me a long time to overcome those feelings. And, and I ultimately landed in a spot where it was like, this is my nose. I was born with this nose. I'm going to die with this nose. If people don't like it, fuck them. Pretty much that's where I got to. People don't like it, fuck them. And I feel good. Like if I reflect on on my attitude as a teenager and early 20-something around it, I'm I'm grateful that I arrived at a point where I, I have accepted it. Um, I love it. People don't point it out anymore. And, and and you know, we've talked about that tactic sometimes of of pointing things out, like perceived flaws in our body so other people won't comment. And I employed that strategy for years too, of like, you know, when I was doing stand-up comedy, joking that I was the love child of um Gonzo the Muppet and Gerard Depardieu, you know, which, which got people to laugh. Right. It, but it's like, I'm going to self immolate and I'm going to point out my weird quote unquote nose, my quote unquote weird nose before anyone else does. So they can't be cruel to me. I, I stopped doing that too. And I've just, the whole point is this article is interesting because I think it, it, it begs the question of how do we handle insecurities in our life? How do we handle physical insecurities specifically with this article? And also, you know, the, these millions of people getting plastic surgery, you know, um, it talks about how through, through Zoom and social media, we, you know, beyond notoriously awkward angles and bad lighting, uh, it says, we witnessed our faces taking shapes we've never seen before. Our expressions on digital media exposing unfamiliar lines, folds, and asymmetries. What the fuck is wrong with unfamiliar lines? The fuck is wrong with folds and asymmetries? Like it, it, it I want to be kind because to, I don't want to say plastic surgery is wrong. I want to say that right now. And I also don't want to judge anyone who's chosen that in their life. But the underlying thing is what is wrong with asymmetry? What's wrong with imperfection? You know, I remember shaving my beard off at one point in the pandemic, Whitney, and I noticed that like I have more fat under my chin. Like I have more of a double chin than I've ever had. Okay. I've also talked in previous episodes about, you know, my, my, and this might be like me calling myself out, but you know, my desire to regrow my hair and, and sort of my insecurities around my hair loss in my mid forties now. Right. So it's like, all right, well, who I'm not, I'm no one to judge because if I end up going and getting like a hair transplant, well, then I'm getting cosmetic surgery too. So I, I want to just go on record. I'm not here to judge anyone. That is not the purpose of what we do on this podcast, but it does offer a critical examination of why people are feeling so insecure after spending 15 months on zoom and social media. Like what is it about us collectively in Western culture that we simply struggle to accept ourselves for the way that we are, you know? So I, I'm curious how you felt reading this article, Whitney, A, and B, I don't think I've ever asked you this in our entire like near decade of friendship. Have you ever thought about having plastic surgery or cosmetic surgery for yourself? I don't recall off the top of my head. I, well, I would say I thought about it more from my waistline. I was curious, like, what would it be like to, um, what's it called when they remove the fat from your stomach? Surgically? Liposuction. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Do people still do that, honestly? They do lipo, but now there's apparently a new technique where they freeze the fat, which is also yeah. referenced in this article. So I think liposuction where they stick the tube in. And FYI, if you've ever seen a video of liposuction, it it looks brutal. It looks... Ooh, it gives me the heebie-jeebies thinking about watching it. Um, but now there's apparently a a cool sculpt fat freezing technique that I, I believe is an alternative to liposuction. I know nothing about it, though. Yes. And I remember hearing about that and thinking, hmm, you know, because for my body, there have been areas that I've wanted to change and I have not changed through diet and exercise so there's two elements. One of this is there's the quick fix of I don't want to diet, I don't want to exercise, so I'm going to do these things. And then I think there's people who are trying a lot and nothing seems to be working and they feel really frustrated, so they resort to that. And for me, it's kind of been a combination of both. I I, I don't usually mind changing the way that I eat, but it can be challenging. I've certainly found that hard in the past year coming off of the strict keto diet and being more relaxed, I have had moments of wanting to eat low carb or lower carb again and found it challenging and frustrating that it was challenging. You know, my desire to eat certain foods, uh, the quote weaknesses of, oh, I'm going to quote give in and eat these other foods. And that has been tough for me, mostly because we're so in diet culture and I have had a disordered eating experience for most of my life. So I think a lot of that has floated around in my head. And then exercise, I've actually found does not make a very noticeable difference in my body aside from some toning. It hasn't helped me majorly in shaping my body in the way that I want, which is interesting because for so many years, I kept hearing like, oh, if you just do these exercises, you'll get these results. And then I would do those exercises. I would be very consistent and not get those results. I would feel shame. And then the temptation to do something more extreme like surgery or injections um, or all these different options out there. Right now, BBLs are really popular. And I was actually watching a, uh, I think they're called Brazilian butt lifts. I feel like that's what that stands for. Well, the reason I didn't say it, the reason I didn't say is because I wasn't sure, but I feel like that's what it is. And I think what they do, yeah, it's a Brazilian butt lift. I think what they do, it's a fat transfer transfer, tra- fat transfer operation where I believe they take fat from certain parts of your body and inject it into your butt. So they'll take it from like your stomach or so. And I could be completely wrong. I'll, I'll have to look this up behind the scenes, but it's supposed to add volume to the butts and give it a tighter, more lifted look, which a lot of women want right now. And and we've talked about the Kardashians impact on beauty culture. And I think they made that very popular. Also, you know, I've been examining how there's some cultural appropriation from people like Kim Kardashian, and she seems to get her inspiration from black women. So it's, it's possible based on a lot of black women's body shapes and styles that that's just been appropriated and now white women and and non-black women want to look like black women, which is really fascinating. Um, And yeah, I I just saw another piece about BBLs. It's a lipo contouring and women are going to all sorts of facilities around the world to get plastic surgery and, and operations done. Jason, I saw a post on TikTok yesterday about how it's so prevalent in Miami, they're actually running out of, I think, Percocet and pain medication because so many people are going to Miami to get those surgeries done. And not only are they running low in medications, but they can't keep up with the demand and they're trying to. So it's actually becoming more risky 
because they're just churning through all these people and they're not fully getting the recovery that they need because it's so painful. They can't sit. I've also seen videos of people traveling to different countries to get these surgeries done and not being able to sit on the flight back. Like they have to, they have to hover over the seat on the flight home because it's too painful for them to sit down or like lean backwards over the chair. I mean, when I see things like that, I do have some judgment around it because I, I feel sad and my sadness feels like a judgment in the sense that it, people are going to such lengths to change their bodies. And of course, there's this element of believing like, well, it's a person's right to decide what they do to their bodies. And some people take it to great lengths. Some people just do small changes. And we all have our different opinions about what that looks like. In fact, the more I think about this, Jason, I've noticed on social media a lot of talk around this. In the series finale of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, Chloe Kardashian talked about her nose job, I think publicly for the first time from my understanding. I saw a recent clip of this reality star, Heidi Montag, I think that's her last name, from The Hills and the, uh, what was the other show? Laguna Beach. And there was a clip of when she got surgery done and her mom's reaction to it. And I've seen a lot of different people in the age range of late mid twenties to thirties and beyond and how sometimes they get this work done and the public doesn't receive it well. And that's part of this conversation too, Jason. It's like, it's one thing if you're personally very satisfied with it, but my guess is that you're not really doing it for yourself. And this is my personal question. I'm trying not for it to be judge judgy, but I don't understand why you would get work done on your body for yourself only. Genuinely. But perhaps, Jason, you might have another reflection on this because of what you went through and the pain of it. Like that to me is part of this conversation too. It's not just like I want to look like someone else or I just want to alter myself a little, you know, because I see other people doing it. That's certainly a big element. But you pointed out more of the like bullying side. And I think we might have addressed this in the episode we did about Khloe Kardashian. She's experienced a lot of bullying. And I could see why someone's trying to reduce the emotional suffering in their life by changing something that they're being targeted for. And I think that's an important element to address here because it's not always as superficial as I just, you know, want to look different. It's like there might be some deep trauma involved. And maybe that's at the core of everybody's decision, right? And I think it's very nuanced in that sense where there's a lot of different motivations going on. But coming back to my question of whether or not you're truly doing it for yourself and what does that mean? Does Are you doing that because you've experienced trauma and you're trying to escape it? But then my next question is, do you actually escape trauma by changing the way that you look? And then there's the element of, are you trying to adhere by beauty standards? And that feels never ending. I personally see someone like Khloe Kardashian, and it feels to me like she's constantly trying to change because she's never satisfied, partially because of the trauma or, or maybe mainly because of the trauma. And then also because she's tr she's creating these beauty standards as much as she's experiencing them, and it's just never going to end. There's always going to be shifts in our beauty standards. I think that's one of the big benefits of getting older, Jason. Right now in my stage of life, I can look back and see how much standards have shifted throughout my lifetime, and I can also historically look at how much they've shifted in our society. And understand that 
changing myself right now doesn't mean that I'll be satisfied in the future because I could change. And this is true of anything, really. You can change yourself to try to please the current standards, but by the time you change, the standards could have changed and then you have to change again. And you're constantly trying to catch up with something when at the root, I believe that the thing that's going to make you feel your best is to work on yourself on the inside because nothing on the outside is going to solve what you're feeling upset about on the inside. And it's easier said than done. And I think that's why we're bringing this up on the show, because mental health could be at the root of a lot of people wanting to change themselves. And um, one of our guests, actually, uh, when we were talking with Kelly, her episode will come out in a month or two. This came up on the show about like our personal responsibility or lack thereof to be a role model. And I see both sides to it. You know, I see that there is some empowerment side to showing off your body. A lot of people say that Kim Kardashian says that, you know, sometimes she just wants to wear a bikini and she doesn't care how other people perceive it because she feels good wearing the bikini and taking those photos that way. And I'm, I'm all for people expressing themselves, but I also just have a doubt in my head whenever I hear things like that, Jason, because I don't know if it's as easy as saying I'm doing it for myself when there's so much psychologically going on in our society that's pressuring us to look and show up in a certain way. I don't fully believe that most people have the mental ability to separate or not even ability, but like the a mental awareness, I suppose, to really know their reasons. And I, I believe from my current perspectives on social media that if you're posting something publicly, it's not like an empowerment thing. It's, it's, to me, at some level, a need for validation. You want somebody to reflect back the empowerment that you feel. You want somebody to confirm that you are as sexy as you feel in that moment. And I can only speak for myself and my personal experiences, my research. I'm willing to be wrong on that, but I just have doubts, Jason. I, I don't I don't believe at this current time that people change their appearance just for themselves. That being said, you said you were had an idea. I don't know if you were seriously considering it. But what what has made you not choose to um pursue the idea of liposuction or the cool sculpt, the fat freezing stuff? Um you know, much like I kind of at, at, at some point was just like, oh, I'm not getting a nose job. I'm over it. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I, I realized that I didn't really want to do that. Once I understood why, what, to your point, once I understood why I wanted to do it, then it, for me was like, if I go into the trauma of not being good enough, if I go into the trauma of, of being shamed, if I go into the trauma of Jason's different and therefore he's bad. So let's tease him like unpacking that mentally helped me to get over the desire to go and get surgery. So you haven't gone in to, to do any of these procedures you mentioned, Whitney. What has, what has your process been though, in, in, since we're talking about mentally unpacking this and we're talking about awareness and the motivation of what drives us to consider these things, with your own self-awareness, what have you found and why have you not done it? Because the, the cons outweigh the pros for me, meaning... There's this is a complicated decision to make. First of all, surgery is dangerous. And I've been on under anesthesia, under the quote knife for health related reasons. And I it's an unpleasant experience. <laughs> you know, for anyone that's experienced anesthesia, it's like I personally do not like any of it. Um, being in a hospital has been unpleasant for me. So there's that. Um, there's a lot of recovery. So if you dig into what, 
the process is actually like, it, it seems very unpleasant and, and kind of seems to me from my surface level awareness, because what I know about things like that are from a few articles, a few posts on social media, a few shows, TV shows I've watched of, of all of this. So I'm sure there's so much more to it, Jason. Um, but it kind of reminds me of what I've heard about childbirth, where a lot of women say, I had no idea what pregnancy and childbirth was going to be like until it happened. And it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And that is what I would guess a lot of these procedures would be that like you hear a lot of the highlights of it, like people showing you their after photos and all of that, but not enough people talk about what the procedure is like and the recovery period is like. And um, that doesn't sound appealing to me. <laughs> but I also think that deep down, and this also ties into, you know, my current decisions around wearing less makeup and not dyeing my hair as it slowly goes gray. I recognize that I don't really need to do those things because I'm not doing those things for myself. And to be clear, I think ultimately most things we do are for ourselves in the sense that like when we do something for other people, it's ultimately about us getting validation, which makes ourselves feel better, right? So I want to clarify that sure, in a way it is for yourself, but I have an issue with the fact that it impacts other people along the way in that if I dye my hair instead of letting it naturally go gray, not only am I doing that to feel prettier, to feel less old, to, you know, to feel younger, <laughs> that's a better term, uh, to feel like I'm fitting in to the beauty standards, but I'm also in a way telling other women that I'm ashamed of my gray hair. And by s subtly saying that, then maybe that woman thinks that she should feel ashamed of her gray hair. And I take that very, very seriously because I notice how I react to women who are confident about their gray hair. I get excited. I feel permission. I get excited to see women who don't wear makeup. I get excited to see women who have a similar body shape as mine and they feel confident about it. That lights me up. So I want to play a role in that. I feel I feel excited to see women that don't get work done on their face. Actresses, like when I see an actress who looks like she's aging, I feel relief. Versus an actress who is losing a ton of weight suddenly, you know, sometimes or celebrities like when they highlight, "Oh, look so and so lost so much weight." That ultimately gives me a bad feeling because then I think, oh, maybe I should lose weight. When I see a woman getting work done or wearing a ton of makeup and like spending so much time on, on how she looks, I want to back away from that person. I don't feel drawn into them. But a woman that's like proud about her, herself, I lean into it. I get excited about it. And it just evokes this comforting, secure feeling within me. And that is also a reminder to me, Jason, that like deep down inside, I don't really care about how I look. I have just felt like I needed to care because of the societal structure that I've been living in. But, you know, most of the time I don't even think about my appearance. I think about my appearance and I'm going to be around other people. And that's part of this article from Refinery29 is how being on Zoom, people are presented with themselves so much. But here's the other thing. With my awareness, I started to pay attention to how I felt looking at other people. For example, today I had a Zoom with some clients and we were talking about video content. I was advising them on a strategy and one of their reactions was, well, if we're going to be on camera, maybe we should get some Botox and, you know, I'm, I got to put on some lipstick. And it wasn't until they said that, that I even looked at them 
from that lens. The whole time I was looking at these women, Jason, I was just thinking about how lovely their personalities were, truly. Like I took it, I took in them a little bit. They they looked pretty, they looked a certain age, but I wasn't sitting there thinking about exactly how old they are. I wasn't thinking about their weight in a detailed way. Like I took it in, but I didn't sit there and go, oh wow, she's this thin or this large. I wasn't thinking about her makeup and her clothes, all of these things that I think about myself. And I imagine that most human beings, we think about all these little details. We know the wrinkles on our face. We know our laugh lines and whether or not we're wearing lipstick and this makeup. When, you know, We know all those details because we're putting it on and we're looking in the mirror and we know ourselves more than anyone else. But I am willing to bet that most people have the similar experiences I do when they go on Zoom, when they see each other at events. They take in somebody briefly, physically, but most of the time they're thinking about how that person makes them feel emotionally. And the more I've become aware of that, Jason, the more ease in which I can go through my life recognizing that what's most important to me in my entire life, no matter how old I am, what's most important is the way people feel about around me and about me which I don't fully have control over, okay? But that makes so much more of an impact than how I look. And lastly, I would say, Jason, that it's sad how much time I've spent and how much time I observe other women and men spend focusing on being attractive. It's disturbing if you really step back and examine it because we don't have control. We only have so much control over how attractive we are. There's only so much that we can do. And it's ultimately nowhere near as powerful to us as human beings than our personalities. So all that said, anytime I start feeling bad about my appearance and wanting to change it, if I can ground myself in that awareness, it centers me in the fact that I don't want to spend as much time worrying about that as I do about wanting to take good care of myself and the people around me on an emotional level. It's beautifully said, Whitney. Very eloquently expressed. I flashed on uh, a few experiences that I've had over the years with, I suppose, um, women that I have dated who have had some experiences with, um, with surgery and also with, um, feeling the need to, to present in a certain way at, at all times. And you talk about the emotional psychological dynamics of all this, which, which to me is absolutely the most interesting part to unpack around all of this, of the, the, the pressures and the standards and why people choose to do these, these surgeries and why they choose to, I mean, you know, why do we do anything we do? Buy the shoes, the clothes, wear our hair a certain way. Uh, you know, I have tattoos and I've had many, many piercings over the years that I've put in and taken out. And I think um, there's a lot I want to unpack here really quickly. Uh, I remember the first time I wanted to get a tattoo before I get into some of the experiences with previous partners. Because some people will be like, oh, well, you know, Jason, you're 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 kind of being maybe... I don't know. I'm projecting here, but you know, some of the reviews we've had on the podcast have referred to to me being as judgmental. Well, surprise, I'm a human being. I get judgmental sometimes. You know, I and and for me, it's an awareness of, oh, maybe I am being judgmental. So I say that to preface like some people might be like, well, you know, you guys are dissecting people who choose to have cos- cosmetic surgery, but Jason, you've had, you know, eight piercings and you're covered in tattoos. Isn't that cosmetic enhancement? One could potentially look at it that way. Like, wasn't your skin and your body good enough? Why'd you get all these tattoos? You know, with, with the tattoo conversation in, in this, it, part of it is that I remember growing up and being a teenager and looking at bands and looking at rock stars and different people who had tattoos and, and saying, that looks really cool. I want to be like them. Could that have been out of my not enoughness? Maybe I'm looking at people like, you know, Dennis Rodman and Axl Rose and, and you know, 
<laughs> being like, they have cool tattoos. I want those too. Part of it was, yeah, I'm a young man. I thought tattoos looked badass, the whole ethos around them. Um, it wasn't that I looked at my body necessarily and went, you look bad without tattoos. It was more of an aspirational thing where I saw other people with tattoos and thought that looks fucking cool. I want that. So with that, you know, that, that was my whole motivation for getting tattoos. But to go back to this idea of, of what I've experienced with girlfriends that have had plastic surgery, I, I have dated two women that had, um, uh, breast augmentation that had breast implants. And it was interesting to, um, with one in particular, I was there with her, um, <clears throat> pre and post surgery, which was a really interesting thing to not only, um, be there for her recovery and, and, and kind of witness that whole process, but how it changed her demeanor after the surgery, like what it did to her personality, which was really interesting. What I witnessed in, in a change in her demeanor and, and how she presented to the world after her surgery was, was, um, was, I don't know if I want to call it confidence or like cockiness, but there was a certain element around her that was like, my breasts are different now. The attention she got was different. I saw how men and women reacted to her differently. Uh, I saw how it changed the arc of her modeling career. Like it was just interesting to see psychologically what it did to her, but then how people reacted to her differently after she had the breast augmentation. And, you know, the, the, I bring this up because there's been a really fascinating movement of explant stories on social media. I've seen a lot of women who have had breast impl implants for decades choosing to get them removed and having explant surgery and talking about how once they healed their relationship to their perception of themselves, they realized they didn't want these pieces of plastic in their body anymore. That you talk about the, 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 um, the cons outweighing the pros, Whitney, you know, they, they realized that when they received this surgery, when they opted for it, they were very much in an insecure place as a younger woman, wanting attention, wanting money, wanting career opportunities, and the size and the shape and the volume of their breasts gave them these different opportunities, gave them different attention, whether that was modeling, acting. One of uh, acquaintances I have was an adult film star at one point, you know, and they're like, I don't want these in my body anymore. My sense of self isn't tied to these things anymore. And they feel like they're poisoning them, right? So, so if you look up explant surgery, it's really the stories these women are sharing of the emotional psychological process of getting their breast implants removed is really, it's moving in a lot of cases to talk about the level of healing they've gone through psychologically in how they perceive their sense of self-worth to the point they're like, I don't want these in my body anymore. And it's beautiful to witness their stories and their willingness to share that. But I'm noticing a ton of women uh, on Instagram and TikTok, maybe it's just my feed and a lot of the, the, the women that I've been acquaintances with are choosing to do this, Whitney. But I think it's really wonderful that they've gotten to a point of psychological healing of them, themselves where they're like, I don't need this to feel good about myself anymore. That seems to be one of the themes I've noticed in these processes. I've also noticed one video in particular, which I don't know if I could go back in my history far enough to link to it in our show notes, um, but there was this girl on TikTok coming at it from a little bit of a different lens around pretty privilege and how she used to be on the larger side physically. And when she lost weight, she noticed how different people treated her. And it was fascinating to watch because I'm sure, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure. I imagine that on some level she's really benefiting from pretty privilege. But first of all, like, why is she any prettier at a different weight? That to me is sad because she's the same person. So hasn't she always been pretty? And are you only pretty when you're smaller in size? I mean, that's a huge issue that we have. In fact, I've, I've heard n numerous people talking about how women have been encouraged to be small 
in a lot of different ways, small in age and small in body size, small in height. There's a lot of fixation on women being shorter than men and like the pressure that puts on men and women and like all these different factors about being small, playing small, which often equates to being weak and how much emphasis we put on just being as small as you possibly can be. Don't take up a lot of room. And this girl is talking about how differently people have treated her, how she used to just be ignored and now she gets attention. And I think a lot of people are aware of that. I think about it as I age too. I mean, I haven't like had a chance uh, to majorly notice, but I, I think in the past year, my awareness around age has shifted a lot. Maybe that's because I've spent more time on social media and TikTok especially. There's a lot of fears around age. And I wonder, you know, as I get older, if I'll start getting less attention. And I think about that sometimes, like when I'm around men at grocery stores, for example, or where, wherever else I would interact with strangers. And and there'll be moments where I'm like, hmm, will I feel sad if men stop paying less attention to me? And then I think like, why does it matter? Why do I even need that? <laughs> like I don't need some random guy cat calling me, telling that at me. I don't I don't I've never liked guys asking me for my number. Like it's one of the most uncomfortable things ever. So in a way, I think it's actually something to look forward to. Like I would I would kind of prefer not to have that attention, but it's the fear and losing power, I think. I'm also reading a book right now about ageism. And there are a couple points from that book I wanted to share. I, I think I'm only like 20% at most into the book. It's called This Chair Rocks, A Manifesto Against Ageism. And at the beginning of the book, the author asks, was I driven by fear of losing my looks, of growing frail, of my own mortality? Wouldn't I be better off making my peace with the passage of time than waging a battle no one could ever win? Now, that specifically is about ageism, but that point about waging a battle no one could ever win goes back to what I said, where no amount of surgeries are ever going to get you what you really deeply want, in my opinion. The Refinery29 article says that people may feel more confident and it might be life-changing not to think about certain features anymore. But then you have to pause on the word life-changing. I don't think that is appropriate because it's not going to change your whole life. It will be there on some level of consciousness in your mind and anyone's mind that knew previously or sees old photos of you. But your body's going to continue to change. So it truly is a battle that you're never going to quote win from the outside. But I do think that you can quote win from the inside if you do that inner work to accept yourself. There was a quote at the beginning of the book that I really love. It brought me peace. It said, we contain all the ages we have ever been. That was said by Anne Lamott. And I love that because it gave me the opportunity to reflect on the privilege that we have to age and all the experiences that we have and all the internal sweetness, memories, knowledge that we contain that no one can possibly see from the outside. And if we spend all that time focused on the outside, Jason, what do we miss out on? The time that you spend at the gym beyond what is good for maintaining your health. If you're obsessed with being at the gym and you're there for hours and hours, what else is going on outside the gym that you perhaps could be experiment experiencing? The time that you spend worrying about food versus savoring the food on your plate, the times that you spend saying no to certain things because you're afraid of the calories or the fat or the carbs. And this is what shifted for me as, as I still am very drawn to low carb eating. In fact, I've done a lot of research on the brain and mental health benefits of higher fats 
and I think for me as Whitney Lauritsen, there's a benefit to it. That's why I choose to continue eating high fat, low carb foods, but I don't deny myself higher carb foods if, if I want them. I let my intuition guide me. Will I find joy in that food? So my point is I've learned to go where the joy is, Jason, not go where the obsession is. And I would like to contain many ages in my life and be able to look back on all of the amazing things I've experienced. I don't want to be whatever age I am at the end of my life wishing that I did more versus focus so much on my appearance because it's going to continue to change no matter what I do. The world's going to continue to change no matter what I do. And it just feels like a race that I will never cross the finish line on. So I'd rather just enjoy the walk. I don't know who said this, but years ago, uh, someone said to me, no one is winning any awards for being the prettiest corpse. You know, we, I think, have a collective obsession with youth, longevity. Some people are obsessed with immortality. We've also covered that topic on previous episodes of the technology that's emerging of downloading our consciousness into alternate bodies like Avatar. Um, I think the question is why? You know, you talked about power, and I think to generalize, women in our culture are given power based on their level of attractiveness. Men are typically given power based on their ability to dominate and make money. And so I think a lot of businesses and industries exist to give people a sense of safety, a sense of power, a sense of status. And in many ways, it's sort of a coalescing, don't you think? I mean, If we go back to our origins of living in small agrarian tribal societies with only a few dozen or maybe at at the most a couple hundred people that we ever know in our lifetime, we've talked about this, you know, I often wonder what the dynamics sociologically were with hierarchy and comparison in those kind of human civilization setups versus now that we have access to comparing ourselves to billions of people on our devices, which is cerebrally speaking, very unnatural to do. Um, How can we shed the idea that to be powerful and be worthy of life, we have to be attractive, earn a ton of money, be surrounded by a ton of fancy material things? Um, I just think at the end of the day, to your point, Whitney, this is all a very slippery slope. Because how many things, how much power, how much status, how much money, how many followers, how many surgeries does it take for a person to finally feel good about themselves? And in many cases, maybe it's never enough. And that's why probably we have a lot of the very toxic consumerist behavior that we have, where it's just consume, 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 consume. And the question is, to your point, if we focus on the inner healing I wonder how much of the desire to do, have, be, and change these things in our lives, how much that would diminish. That as we begin to love and accept and really know ourselves, that the desire to have these things and change our bodies and have these surgeries, if that proportionately goes down, maybe it does. I find that for me, and I can only speak for myself, that the more I do the work to really accept myself the difficult parts, the parts I've hated for a long time, the parts I've been resisting loving. The more I do that work, the less that I feel the need to have externalized things define who I am. Be that changing my nose completely. Be that, um, you know, going to the gym and, 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 you know, gaining all this muscle so I can feel powerful as a man, because that's the image of masculinity in our society, this big ripping, rippling muscular figure, or, you know, having a really expensive house and a really expensive car. Cause look, you've made it now. Good job, human man in America. You've done well. Um, 
I don't know. I just, I, I think there's a real liberation in healing ourselves and truly stopping caring. That's, that's a horror. It's true. That's stopping, stopping ourselves in the process of being overly concerned with what other people think of us. This is not easy work. This is very difficult work. And I don't know. I think Whitney, I just, I, I'm, I'm grateful to be feeling a deeper sense of liberation, not completely liberated by any stretch at all but a, a deeper sense of liberation from those things as I go on in age. Um, you know, it, it, I, I feel more free and not as shackled to those things as I did when I was younger, you know? And so with that being said, we are curious about your feedback and your perspective on all of this, dear listener. Uh, do you, have you had plastic surgery? Have you had cosmetic surgery? How do you feel about it now? Um, how has that changed your life emotionally? spiritually, physically? How do you see people responding to you? Um, we're really curious because this is, of course, always an exploration. And if you want to dig deeper into any of the resources we mentioned, the books Whitney mentioned, this Refinery29 article, any of the resources we mentioned, again, our website is wellevator.com, W-E-L-L-E-V-A-T-R.com. Go to the podcast section. It will take you to the show notes and the transcript for this episode and all of our previous episodes. So you can dig in to our pontifications and musings on all things around mental health, emotional wellness, and the often glorious and confusing human experience. We also have a great Patreon account. We have some amazing people supporting us there. For our new patrons, thank you for your support. Thank you for your financial and energetic support, which has allowed us to birth a new podcast called This Hits the Spot, where we are bringing you our favorite new products, services, books research, TV shows, the things that Whitney and I are really excited about. So when you sign up for our Patreon account or you subscribe to our newsletter, you get access to our private podcast, This Hits the Spot. With that being said, we appreciate your listenership, your reviews on Apple Podcasts, your DMs, your emails, your feedback, all of the interaction and all of the messages you send us. Thank you so much for your support, your listenership and your great communication. And we'll be back with another episode of This Might Get Uncomfortable Soon. Stay tuned.